Hey, welcome to this month's Hump Day Hangout, Focus on Training. I'm Steve Pegram, President of the International Society of Fire Service Instructors, also Fire Chief in Goshen, Ohio, a suburb of Cincinnati, and I'm one of your co-hosts today. Also with me is Aaron Heller from New Jersey. Say hello, Aaron. Hello, everybody. It's good to be back for another Google Hangout. Um, Bobby Halton from Fire Engineering Penwell is going to be joining us here in a little bit. He had to step away from the camera for a few minutes, um, but we're glad that you're with us again this month on the Hump Day Hangout, first Wednesday of the month focused on training. And uh, our topic this week is going to be talking a little bit about the credibility of instructors. When you're looking to hire an instructor or to uh, bring somebody in to teach for your department, how do you select them and what makes someone credible or not credible as an instructor? And, and uh, both Aaron and I, in dealing both locally in our fire departments, we both have a background of being volunteer chiefs as well as working in combination paid volunteer systems as well as teaching on the road uh, you know, na nationally and even internationally. Um, we get a lot of exposure to this and, and one of the big complaints we hear is that the quality of the instructor often uh, is lacking. So we're going to get into that topic here in just a second. I want to remind everybody if you'd like to ask us a question, uh, hashtag FE talk. Uh, on Twitter. You can send us a question and we'll try to answer it while we're on here for the next uh, 55, 56 minutes. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to my partner, Aaron, and why don't you kick us off on our topic this week. All right. Well, thanks a lot. And for those of you who don't know me, uh, I work as a career captain in Hamilton, New Jersey, just outside of Trenton uh, in, a, in a fairly large combination department. And uh, I served as a volunteer fire chief in a little town called New Egypt, New Jersey for quite a few years. So, uh, like Steve said, our background is, is uh, pretty varied that we can cover, cover all of it. And the reason this idea came up, uh, I was in uh, Louisiana over the weekend with a bunch of fire chiefs, and we were sitting around talking about training, and one of the chiefs brought up the fact that he's paid a lot of money to have instructors come in, uh, both local and, and folks from, that come in off the road, basically, from national, national recognized places. And he felt that many of the times he was paying somebody who probably had less credentials than some of his own people and who really didn't deliver much of a message, but they had written themselves a very good uh, biography and, and had, had you know sold themselves on blogs or on Facebook or wherever it was, and then he was a bit disappointed with what he ended up getting. So I thought that this is a really important topic for us to cover uh, because we, we're sending our folks out and we have a very limited training budget and we want to get the most bang for our buck and we want our folks to come out of that training you know better better and more prepared than they were when they went in and I'm not sure that's always happening so that's that's the uh, gist of today's and that's what we're going to try and do for the next 50 some minutes uh, so I guess the, the first big question that that comes to mind is you know why are we picking who we're picking and, and what's the motivation behind it? Um, so I think that's probably the first thing we should we should probably discuss, Steve. Well, and I think from from a fire chief's perspective in my community, um, we're a little bit lucky that we do have some paid staff. Uh, we're a combination department with full time, part time, and some volunteers. Um, but have the advantage of having some people we can assign to training and to coordinate training activities. But we still go outside for for pretty much all of our certification. So if we hire somebody, we're sending them outside to an academy uh, and they're training that person and sending them back to us. And the same thing for a lot of our uh, company officer development series and things like that, we're sending people out. Um, not big enough organization where we have full-time training staff and full-time people. And uh, I think one of the challenges we see locally is, and what you're specifically talking about, is um, the call volume and experience level of the instructor. And what I mean by that is we can bring in, there's a lot of people that will come in and teach auto extrication for me, but how many of them go to a lot of auto extrications, uh, have a lot of experience hands-on doing auto extrications versus somebody who took a class and is just regurgitating that information. And I think where some of that is lost is I'm um, not saying that the person who takes a class and then regurgitates that information is is bad, but there has to be a situation where 
you know, you understand the credibility of the person because they've been there and they've done that. Now, because of that, I think there's a default often to only look towards instructors that are come from urban, uh, busier uh, departments. And I think that obviously those are great resources. And, and a lot of people that you see, especially nationally, that are teaching come from those busier uh, departments because, frankly, they're going to a higher frequency of alarms, which gives them more experience and more slides in their slide tray, as we used to say. But uh, trying to find that balance. So what are your thoughts on that, Aaron? I mean, how does a, somebody in maybe a small to medium-sized department gain the credibility to teach when they're not going to a fire every day or even every week or an auto extrication? It's, it's difficult. It's really difficult. Um, but I think if you want to be that instructor uh, and, and you really want to step up and, and provide that service to your department or other departments, whether you're working for the academy or you're working, you know, trying to teach at FDIC or, or somewhere else, I, I think, you, number one, you have to prepare yourself to, and you have to be a student of whatever you're going to do and try to surround yourself with the best that you can find in that business. Uh, a good example is, since we're using extrication, I know a lot of guys have been have been pumping up that they're they're teaching new car technology and they're teaching what we need in new vehicle extrication techniques, and that's great. But you have to try and learn from the actual new vehicles. So if I'm going to be a new vehicle technology instructor, I may not go out and cut a dozen of them a month. It's just simply not an option. You know, even for those of us who are very well developed into that field and have a lot of contacts, we can only get so much of it. So in, in my estimation with that, to get yourself better prepared, you have to, number one, know the old techniques that we always used. And you have to learn those and be very good at what we, what we were teaching. And then you have to be able to develop into the newer stuff that we're learning. And, and maybe that comes from taking a class like Carl Haddon's out at FDIC or, or reading the blogs and so forth and the posts that Dave Dalrymple puts on here or, uh, or some of the other guys are, are putting out. Um, so I think that's where you start getting your base. Um, the other thing I would do is I would personally go to the auto dealerships and start really honing my craft, understanding where the SRS systems are, things like that. Um, and that makes you better at what you do. And obviously, practice, practice, practice. Um, and the big thing is, and it, it goes for every instructor, and we're seeing tons of this, is learn it from the best guys that you possibly can, whether it be in your region or if you can afford to go nationally or wherever, and utilize those guys as your brain trust, but make sure you give them the credit credits where credit's due. So when you're putting together your PowerPoint for your county association or whoever it may be, you know, it doesn't hurt to say, listen, I, I learned this at FDIC from, you know, Lee Hollins, or I learned this from Carl Haddon or, or, or Isaac Fraser, whoever you got it from. That's the way you have to start working your way up to the credibility level, I believe. Um, you know, and, and whether it's engine ops or truck ops, there's so many good guys out there who are we're, we're willing to share. Uh, I did not get to the level I'm at by inventing the stuff all by myself. And I think that's what instructors really have to, they have to look towards mentors. Uh, you know, I've, I've been blessed, Steve, I know you've been blessed with some great mentors in our career that got us to these points. And you really soak up everything you can about what you plan on teaching or what you plan on doing in your fire department as an officer or as a leader. And that's how it starts to develop, if that, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Kind of, kind of long-winded answer, but I think that's the way yeah. you go with it. Well, and you said two things that, that immediately popped out to me and, and even expanded the conversation we're having today. And one of them is, in order to instruct, you already have to be proficient. Yes. So if you're not proficient in a task or a topic, then you really shouldn't be the one teaching it. Now, and again, uh, it seems like an oxymoron, but if you're in an organization that doesn't make a lot of fires or doesn't make a lot of extrications or whatever the topic is, you need to fill that void somehow, and you fill that void through training right. and, and repetition and that sort of thing. So, you know, if you're in a uh, department that has a lower call volume, a lower frequency of events, um, you're, you may be, to, to reach that level of instruction or being an instructor, may, may take you a little bit longer in years of service, but also the frequency of your training and the frequency uh, of that experience, you can't uh, fill the, the entire void with training and be proficient and teach something, but obviously 
um, you know, there's you, you you're limited by the confines of your department and, and the call volume. But you have to be proficient first. You can't go out and start teaching auto extrication because you took a class last Saturday. Right. Uh, and I think we can expand on that proficiency in a second. And the other one that really popped out and we probably could do a whole hump day hangout on is giving credit. And as you said, it's okay to use other people's information. It's okay to use other people's topics. It's okay to use things. If, it, if it's on the internet, if, if you're able to download it, it's okay to use it. I think anybody would tell you that, anybody that's in the industry. But give credit to who you borrowed it from, who you heard it from, or where you got it. Um, there's copyright laws and trademark laws that you can get into when you start downloading articles and photocopying them. But more importantly, you know, if if somebody said something at FDIC or on a, in a seminar or uh, in a Google Hangout that you heard, taking it and reusing it word for word but calling it yourself or not giving credit to it is theft. It, it's, uh, you know, you're stealing that person's intellectual property is the term they use, uh, the legalese use. And we see a tremendous amount of that, of people basically stealing content, stealing information. And it's not hard. I mean, almost everybody I know of in the fire service will freely give whatever they have to benefit other departments and other departments' training, but they want to get credit for what they're doing and what they're creating or what they're working on. Um, have you run into that, Aaron? And, and if so... You know what? What have you done to prevent having that conflict of interest? I, I've I've run into so much of it in the last. You know, I, I would say that it was when I was young in, in the beginning of my instructing career. I was walking on eggshells to make sure I was proficient in something. Number one. So I'll start with the proficiency. Uh, a good example. Uh, my private company was hired to go go train overseas, and we were doing a bunch of rope rescue work. And when I looked at what needed to be done and I looked at the skills of the people I needed to take with me, I knew that in reality, I'm on a SOC team, but I am the last guy that probably should be teaching it because I know how to get it from my head to my hands, but I'm not sure that I could get it from my head to somebody else's head, if that makes sense. So when I put that team together, I looked and said, I'm the weak guy. I should not be teaching this. I'm going to be the fireman's helper over here. And that's what I did. And that took a lot to kick myself in my own ego I suppose but it was really important because too many guys will do that they'll just take it on and say yeah I can do it and really are you truly proficient in that skill to do it and that and I've seen that over the years and, and that that really as an as a student you see right through that guy who's you know throws you the piece of rope and says tie the knot you know that, that that's not how it should be done um, so proficiency is big the credit to, to who you got it from in the last few years, it has just, the theft of intellectual property is disgusting. And I know it's discussed all the time amongst a lot of instructors. Um, and we see it. We're seeing it almost daily. Uh, probably the biggest compliment that I got at FDIC this year, I finished up doing my class, and one of the quotes that I had in my class uh, was regarding stretch and line and, and, and doing some engine stuff. And in that slide, I credited and I thanked uh, uh, Chief Ray Hoff. And uh, Ray, Ray was a legend out in the Chicagoland area, and, and the whole family is, of course. But uh, Ray taught me some stuff when I was attending classes at, at University of Illinois years ago, and it, it never left me. But I made sure that when I used the material that I got from him, and it was all paraphrased, and, and it's really kind of been bastardized over the years, but I still wanted to make sure that it went you know, somebody knew that that came from Ray Hoff, and it, it really was not my original thought, although I, I twisted it into what I needed it to work for my class. And at the end of that class, I had a fellow come up to me and shake my hand and say, Ray was a damn fine friend of mine. He was one of my mentors. And to see that you put his name up on that material just warmed my heart. And you know what? It, it, it really, just talking about it now gets me really, you know, kind of emotional because to think that we have the ability to carry on somebody else's work like that and give them credit for it is huge. At least in my opinion, it's huge. And uh, that's the honor that all these guys who come, come up with their own material deserve. You know, yourself, myself, all the guys that we know that are teaching at FDIC and all over the country, even the guys who are, who are teaching at Little Academies but developing their own programs, they deserve that. 
it's a lot of work to put this stuff together. So that's that's kind of where I lay with that. That's that's like really tried and true to my heart. When I see somebody grab something that I know isn't theirs originally, I'm not ashamed to jump online and say to them, "Hey, I remember when uh, uh, Dave Gallagher taught me that in 1995 at FDIC." Or you know, maybe not calling them out saying, "Hey, you just stole this stuff," but saying, "Hey, I remember when you know." Bob I've heard Swift. this before, and it was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, and and listen, it's it's just like we're going through with with the studies and all the testing and everything now. Listen, some of the stuff that science is starting to show us is stuff that we learned 40 years ago, but we really didn't have the science to back it up. So now these are the things that we can give credit where credit's due, and and uh, as instructors, what better thing to do? You know, we've learned from some greats. On that topic. Um, Aaron, I know on on the private side of your business, you know, you, you you do provide training, a lot of different types of training to various size departments. Maybe give us, you know, when you're talking about the credibility of an instructor, how do you decide who you're sending where? Is it based just on availability, their background and experience, like you mentioned? Um, but also, how does it play in whether you're going to, you know, Chicago versus Pennington, New Jersey? Right. Know? size of the organization, that sort of thing. How do, do you deal with that, and how do you make all that fit together? We do. We do. And um, and, I, and my guess is that all the training companies do or try to, uh, as well as, you know, all the all the academies and stuff. Uh, you have to take in a – first off, you have to make sure the guy really is able to do the job uh, because, I like I said, I've sat through classes where the instructor really didn't have the grasp on what he should have, and the students saw through it and it wasn't a good learning environment for anybody including the instructor so making sure that your people whoever they are and in whatever setting they are are truly masters of their craft is key uh, does availability come into play for me on the private side not as much because I have a great amount of guys to draw from but I know it does become an issue at the local academy level because it's sometimes tough to have a big enough staff to cover everything so I know that that is a, a thing that directors of academies look at really hard, and sometimes they're they're going with the best available, which might not always be the best, but it's it's what they have to work with, and they're they're doing the best they can with it, and and uh, I understand that. Um, for for when you're traveling and and you're going other places, being aware of where you're going and aware of the levels to which you're teaching. Um, my advice is that you always talk to everybody like a gentleman or a lady and that you don't talk down to anybody ever. Uh, we've all been in those classes where the instructor wasn't really aware of how things should be in that region and told them how it is, you know, this is how I do it in New Jersey. Well, it may not be how they do it in Oklahoma or wherever. So you have to really be aware of the culture. When we go overseas, we've done a lot of work in the, in the South Pacific Islands. And um, being culturally aware is very important because you, if you insult somebody, you've lost it. And you may not even realize you've insulted them, but you, you may have lost, lost the class and not been able to, to get your points across as needed. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, those are two tough things. But like I said, even at the local academy level, trying to find the right guys to teach the right skills, you know, I ride the engine every day is a great idea that I'm teaching roof ops. Maybe not. You know, maybe uh, the fact that I've never done special ops is a good example of why I shouldn't be teaching confined space. That sort of thing. So it's it's not just uh, first available. Absolutely. Um, I thought it was interesting. You, you talked about culture and, and um, the type of department and how they do things there. You as an instructor, when you're going out of town, when you're going someplace, especially someplace you haven't been before, how do you prepare yourself for that visit? I mean, what's some of the homework that you do or to prepare? Because like, I understand what you're saying. You could go someplace and you're, just your terminology could be completely foreign, and a lot of us don't realize that. Um, you know, we were in, I was in a panel at UL a few weeks ago, and everybody on that panel, everybody that was there, uh, I would consider credible people – uh, from all across the country, but the terminology and how we respond to fires and and how we stretch our first line and what nozzle we use, we couldn't get five of us to agree, let alone 25 of us. 
Yeah. How do you prepare yeah. yourself for that environment and, and knowing the culture and, and the way things are in a place that may be foreign to you you've never been to before? Um, there's a few things that I do. The, the first thing I would do is I would be in touch with whoever is the boss there and find out truly what they want. See what their intentions are from this training. Um, because I can't bring them just what I want them to get. I need to bring them what their bosses want them to get. So that's that's the key. I, I, and kind of vet out how the department operates, how it's set up, you know, um, the, the call volume and the types of calls and the type of community. You know, is it, an, is it a, an urban community? Is it economically downtrodden or is it somewhere where it's very affluent and, uh, you know, 89% of their runs are medicals, you know, versus, you know, a place like Detroit, you know. So these are the types of things that uh, that I would try to vet out beforehand. Try to I would study their websites and study the town's websites. We we do this all the time and uh, try to get some insight. Try to gain insight into what they do and how they do it. And uh, and that would be that would be the first thing. Uh, I can tell you when we when the first time I ever went overseas, we were teaching in American Samoa. And I bought a book about American Samoa and started reading it because I just I didn't want to uh, I didn't want to say something that was going to be politically incorrect that was going to get myself looked at like oh what's this dope doing now um, so I, I just wanted to be aware of everything I could and uh, that's that's those are the things but talking to the chief or whoever's going to bring you in and again this doesn't have to be from from a training company it could be your you work for the county academy. But uh, they do things a little different in the north part of the ca the county, and you work in the south part, and trying to get that together. Whether it be, uh, you know, how do they do their rural water supply? Because we're going to do an engine company class for you, and we want to make sure that what we teach jives with what you do or what you foresee your department wanting to do. And I think that's that's very Im in important to get the the word across. And I guess you know I'll, I'll throw it back at you, Steve, as a chief officer. Um, who controls those purse strings and tells his training officer, listen, we're going to do ABC training this year. I want you to start looking in uh, people. What types of things should should we be talking to you about as the chief of the department? Well, you know, what we usually look for, and, and another point I was going to make is um, a question should be, you know, what problem or issue are we trying to solve? You know, typically if an organization is going outside to address a training topic, they have identified a deficit, whether it be a new building type, uh, a new business, a new risk, uh, or they've had a bad day. And, and I've seen that a lot where departments really ramp up their training when they have had incidents that didn't go very well. So I think one is, you know, and even from a chief's perspective, uh, if I'm looking for an instructor, what am I trying, what void am I trying to fill in my organization by bringing this outside person in? And I'm lucky and blessed to be in a circle of friends that teach at FDIC. So I get to know a lot of the people that teach different topics, and I know who to go for, uh, who to go to for different topics. But definitely in our organization, when we evaluate our training, we look at what is more uh, routine that our internal training staff can handle, um, you know, our, our drivers training, uh, things that we do every year, things that we do consistently. But when we get into more of uh, specialized training uh, or certain topics, especially on the leadership and company officer development stuff, there's some great people out there. And usually what I do is, I, if, if I don't know the person personally, but most of the people I've hired and brought in, I've read their book. If they've written a book or I've attended their class, probably attended their class a few times. So I'm doing my own vetting of watching them, seeing if the information is relevant. But I also contact them when I contract them in. And we usually contract two or three people a year to come out and teach for us in Goshen. Um, I kind of sit down with them beforehand and explain to them our environment, how our department operates. Like you said, the culture of the organization. Uh, if there's a taboo topic, uh, mm -hmm. I let them know what that is up front so that they don't make the mistake of – you know, talking about something or mentioning uh, something that might put people on the offense or the defense, um, and so that we can spend the time when they show up and they spend the time training, it can be more beneficial to everybody, and we can stay on topic rather than getting off on a tangent or go in a different direction. And um, you know, I've been blessed where I've worked that we haven't had any uh, significant, serious 
uh, problems with this, but I've also worked at uh, neighboring to departments that have had some huge issues where they've had to spend a tremendous amount of money to bring in um, outside training to help reorganize a department, reorganize their tactics and their strategies and things like that. And I know from a fact from talking to a lot of those people, there was a huge issue, as we've been talking about, about the credibility of the people that came in and taught. Um, they were getting the certificate from the right people, the right organizations, but the person that they sent to teach um, wasn't the right person. And, um, you know, we were talking about Tony Correa a few minutes ago, and he just mentioned something on, uh, on Twitter. And, uh, you know, and we talked about this a little already, but before you teach, you have to learn how to be an instructor. And uh, I think we can go into that in a second. But, you know, just because you're a firefighter, just because you're a really good firefighter, doesn't necessarily make you a really good instructor. Right. And, um, I mean, I view myself as an okay instructor. Um, and I enjoy teaching on certain topics. And I, and I try to limit myself to those topics that are relevant to what I do every day. So a lot of the things I teach – um, sure, I could go out and teach tactics and engine company and truck company, but I haven't ridden an engine or a truck in seven years. So when I teach, and for example, when I taught at FDIC, I teach about being a fire chief and how to be successful as a fire chief, how to make decisions, how not to get yourself fired, things like that that I actually have the tools in my toolbox and the experience to talk about. And I think that's important is bringing experience. And we go right back to what our first topic was, is you, you, know, you have to have the credibility, you have to have the experience and uh, make up for that. Um, but you know, as a chief officer, when I'm, I do my own vetting of who we invite in. I read their books, I, I read their articles, and but I also make sure that we have a conversation. Usually, I'll send them a pretty lengthy email. This is our department. This is how we operate. Uh, this is what our staffing levels are. We still use volunteers. We use AMARS. We have non-hydrated areas, so they understand the environment they're coming in to teach in. Because if a guy comes in to talk, uh, you know engine company placement um, and all of his slides are of hydrants, well, that doesn't do us much good because 50% of our district doesn't have fire hydrants. Um, right. But it's not his fault necessarily if he didn't know that coming in. So I think it's, it's on the responsibility of the instructor but also the department hosting the event to make sure both parties are in, in the loop on what's going on. Yeah. I, I completely completely agree and uh, and it is the, the instructors got to do his homework that's uh, that's a big part of presenting a good class I, I, you know I, I could tell you years ago um, I thought I was an okay instructor and then I started hanging out with really good instructors and I found and I started looking up and thinking my god I have a long way to go and uh, you know every day I think I have a long way to go but back then I really figured out that I did and um, I, I took a lot of classes on how to be a, an instructor, you know, development and so forth. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll give a plug to our friend, to Billy Hobson. His class at FDIC every year, his instructor's boot camp, is just fantastic for that kind of thing because we have to hone that skill. And the, the, the better we understand how we're going to present our pro program, who we present it to, I think that lends to our credibility as well. But, uh, you know, Billy's great to teach that class because he's been an instructor for, God, how many years? 20-some, 30-some years. But uh, Right, and that's what he does for a living. Yeah, yeah. But as opposed to, you know, a guy with a year or two in as an instructor shouldn't be teaching that class. So right. it, it, it all balances out. Yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely the case. I, I see that Chief Bobby Halton has joined us. How are you, Bobby? I'm great, guys. I apologize to everyone. I had a... I had to take a call with uh, uh, some of our uh, other things going on. I, I, I greatly apologize. I think this is a really important topic. And I think one of the things that's interesting, too, is that when we look at instructors, you know, um, it, it, it's fascinating. I, you know, I get the FDIC um, evaluations every year back from everyone who taught. And, 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 and just for example, I could be going through somebody's evaluations and could say, you know, greatest guy in the world, best class I ever took, greatest guy in the world, best class I ever took, worst class I ever took, the guy should never teach again, yeah. you know, and, and, and it's the same class, it's the same person. Um, for example, there were some folks that absolutely loved uh, my, my friend uh, Admiral Moore's talk at the uh, uh, main program and other folks who couldn't understand, you know, why he was there. I mean, it was really interesting, and and a lot of it's just our perspective. So sometimes 
what's, what I find interesting as instructors, and, and I think it goes to our credibility, is I always try to find out how they feel about their evaluations because I, I always look at, to try to find out from instructors as we're trying to find new folks for FDIC um, how 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 they feel about it and, and one of the one of the best uh, harbingers of whether or not you've got a good instructor coming is if they say yeah I always read them but I'm really sensitive I'm probably overly sensitive because if I get one bad evaluation it, it'll bug me for forever and I say you're perfect because mm -hmm. <laughs> if if you've ever if you ever run into one of those characters who really doesn't care what people think about them that they're generally very unattractive people you, you know what I mean in in, in, in a social setting and and so I, I I find that they they tend to have more problems there's a, there's been some great um, studies that have been done on doctors who get sued and 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 it, it's really interesting they find that the doctors who have really good side uh, really good bedside manners in other words they take time with the patients and they tend to build a rapport and and they ask sensitive questions um, they don't get sued much but the doctors who are all business who just come in and say well Mrs. Smith I've been looking at your chart and we're gonna have to have you in for a surgery Wednesday and uh, it'll go fine I've done a thousand of these any questions that guy gets sued you know what I mean but the guy who comes in and says how you feeling how's the food you know, do you have any kids? Is there anybody I, you know, you know, can you know, can, can we make you more comfortable? That that guy or gal doesn't get sued, and I think it's the same with instructors. I, I think there's some folks who are really know their stuff, and come across to a certain segment of our audience, and they don't come across another. I, I guess it's why we have chocolate and vanilla. <laughs> You, you know that goes back, and and it you know it it takes me back to an earlier discussion we had in, in this in this session, where we were talking about how do you choose who you bring in, or as a guy who's going to assign instructors to a program, how do you choose those people? And uh, the prime example for me was um, not too many years after the Superstore fire in Charleston, uh, True North awarded a scholarship for training to the Charleston Fire Department and they asked us to go in and, and do that training and it was on commercial firefighting big box store and commercial firefighting so it was a really scary task um, just knowing the the sentiments of everything going on and I went down and I met with Chief Tippett and Chief Carr and wanted to find everything out that I possibly could find out before we before we ever went there and it was very, it, it put my mind at ease when I got done because, number one, they were fantastic to us. The, the most gracious hosts and the firefighters just ate up this type of training, which was really probably some of the most remarkable in my career when you think of the impact that it, it would have. Uh, but we were looking at who we were going to take with us. And it was, we have this great group of guys from FDIC that could all go. And the one person who kept standing out in my mind who we said had to go was uh, Kevin Maloney and I don't know if you guys I know Bobby I'm sure you know Kevin Kevin's retired now as a district chief in Worcester but Kevin was heavily involved in this in the cold storage fire um, and it was important that we had Kevin with us because here was somebody who wasn't just going to teach with sympathy but with empathy he had truly truly lived it and been there and that rang true for the whole week based on it. So when you go into certain things and certain topics that are somewhat sensitive in a fire department, these are the type of things you really do need to look at as instructors and, and to get that, that the whole grasp of what we're doing. And, and that's a, that's a, and Steve can speak to this too because we all, all of us are responsible for hiring instructors and there's a big difference between somebody who's sympathetic and somebody who's empathetic. Yeah, and uh, you can only be empathetic if you've actually experienced what you're talking about or what you're uh, relating to. In other words, you can only be empathetic about an LODD if you've gone through an LODD, and and that that doesn't mean that other people aren't sympathetic, which is important. Right, but empathy is a different level. Um, you know, you can only talk about the the what goes on in your head when you're running a fire if you've actually run a fire. You know, right, and and there are folks out there who are teaching and who are speaking who've never run a fire. 
Yeah. And that, that's a credibility issue. You know, if you've never done it, I, I really believe in the Marine Corps motto that every Marine is a rifleman first. And I was never a Marine. But I think that there, and there, people tell you we have no correlation to the military. I think that's wrong also. Yeah. But the, 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 the Marine Corps motto that every, 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 every soldier is a rifleman means that they understand the job below them and the job above them, every single one of those guys and gals, and not just because they, uh, you know, were read about it in a book or took a training class on it, they've performed at that level. One of the cool things that they do with the ROTC program in the United States military is that during the summers, those those young men and women who are in the naval program go through a thing called the contour tours, and during those tours, they actually one summer they'll go out with a submarine group, the next summer they'll go out with the ships, the next summer they'll go out with the Marine Corps, the next summer they'll go out with the aviation group. So they get they get acclimated and they get to participate, actively participate in all of those communities, not as an officer, which is where they're going to be someday, but as a sailor. You know, they 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 scrape barnacles, they do work, they they they, they post watch, they're obviously mentored and and, and supported by a, 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 a sailor or a marine who's in that position, but they really get a good feel. And then as they go through their training, they, they're diligent about making sure that they're absolutely proficient and, and capable at every single level. And it, it's really kind of neat. It's, it's, it's a neat program. And I think the fire service is well served, and I think we're as, I think we're as effective and as impactful as we are in our communities because 99.9% .9 of us have gone from recruit firefighter to firefighter to engineer or to senior man or senior firefighter to, to, to engineer to lieutenant to captain to district chief to assistant chief to battalion chief to uh, you know uh, to, to, to deputy chief you know through the whole very few of us went from, you know, uh, firefighter to chief. And anybody who's done that, that you lose credibility. I mean, it, you got to have that body of work so that when you're talking about rolling up first on the engine or rolling in second on the truck or first on the, you've been there. You've done that. You, you've got the battle scars. You you understand how difficult that can be. And, and we're ill-served by, I think, the folks who haven't. Bobby, before you uh, came on with us, we were talking about making sure that you give credit to where you borrow information from. And I know you and I have had this discussion before, but from a, the head of FDIC as well as, a, as the editor of a magazine, um, you know, we both already gave examples of how instructors can lose credibility when they don't give credit to who they got the content or information from. Can you hit on that a little bit from the editor-in-chief point of view? Yeah, the, the word is attribution. It's called attribution, giving attribution to the person who, whose materials you're using. And it can be in a general sense. Um, you don't have to be ultra-specific about it all the time. Like, say, uh, say you read, just read um, uh, Perot's book, Normal Accidents, and you're giving a speech on how systems interact together sometimes and have unforeseeable consequences. You don't have to sit there and say, as Perot said on page 127 or whatever, but you should say that somewhere in your presentation or whatever, where you got the information from. One of the things that I, I like to do, and I learned it from one of my mentors, is at the beginning of my PowerPoints, I, I usually have a slide or two of where I got the information from. So that on every slide, I don't have to say that this came from wherever or that came from wherever, but people know, well, this isn't what Bobby Halton thinks. This is what you know Sidney Decker thinks or Charles Perot thinks or Alan McLucas or Maldonado that's called giving attribution because to, to do so on every slide would get tedious. You know what I mean? It would get and sometimes if it's a really specific quote, like if you're quoting, you know, Childs or you're quoting uh, somebody like that specifically, clearly you want to have a quote deal. But one of the one of the constructs that I use and I learned from Lincoln is I'll take a lot of stuff right out of the Bible and, and then just change a few words or move it around or make it modern language. So although it was a biblical uh, uh, pull it's in modern day language. You don't have to tell people that. But say, um, my my good friend Chief Brunacini has gotten a million. He's got a million little. Uh, um, uh, my favorite one is, 
and I won't use the the bad word that he used, but we were having an uh, um, uh, uh, unplug session, and it was Tommy Brennan and myself and Chief Bernasini, and a young man got up and for 15 or 20 minutes he spoke about how he couldn't get his bosses or his boss to to be as excited about training as he is and to get out there and and to do this and to do that and and blah blah blah, and the kid just railed for you know 15, 20 minutes about how he couldn't fix his boss, and and uh, I looked at Chief Brennan, and Chief Brennan looked at me, and we both looked over at Chief Brunacini, and Chief Brunacini leaned back in his chair, and he said, son, you can't, and I'll use the word poop, but he said, son, you can't poop up, and that was it, <laughs> one of the greatest quotes I've ever heard in my entire life, and and Whenever you, whenever I tell people that, I try to always say that's not a Bobby Halton quote. That's a that's a Chief Brunacini quote. You know what I mean? That's a Chief Brunacini quote. But oftentimes we'll pick up a quote or something like I can't remember who told it to me, but somebody once told me, "Friends come and go, enemies accumulate." Great quote. Use I don't know who I don't know where it came from. The other day I heard another great quote, and I can't remember where it came from. It was the truth is not the same to all people. Mm -hmm. That the truth has many different. There's many yeah. different versions of the truth because there's it, there's billions of people. It, the, the, some Zen Buddhist in India, his truth is not going to be the same truth to Bobby Halton in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or or my good friend Mike Galliano out in Seattle. All of our truths are somewhat nuanced. That that being said, if you pull a, a direct story, like say uh, someone you know tells a story about whatever. You should probably say, as my friend Andy Fredericks, or you know, boo 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 once said, boom boom boom, because to not do so um, isn't fair, or, or 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 and just to pull other people's stuff and make it look like yours isn't fair, and it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you you have to give gross attribution all the time, but you know, you should be uh, you you should whenever you can, and to quote John Kennedy. If you want to be quotable, quote. Yeah, that's and, a great and, point. And, and it, it's, a, it's just the right thing to do. And, and sometimes we can't. Sometimes for, for lack of space or... And, and one of the things that happens with us, and, and, and it's an interesting uh, psychological phenomena, is that some people have heard some stories so many times that when they retell them, they forget that they, they, they feel like they were there. You know what I mean? Right. And in, the, in their minds, they really think they were there. I had it happen to a friend of mine who came to me one time and he said, you know, Bobby, I thought I was at that fire because I heard that story so many times, and when I pulled the records, I was off that day. And he goes, but if you'd ask me, I'd swear to God I was there. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, it's just the brain is a funny thing. It's a really, it's a really soft instrument, really powerful instrument. And uh, so, so that can happen to people. So don't and and don't. I think we run a we 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 run a tremendous. There's a tremendous um, 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 hazard, moral hazard, when we ascribe motive to people. Um, you know, in other words, they did this because of uh, you know all, all Republicans hate unions or all all Democrats are stupid or all Libertarians want to legalize all drugs or when we take a group of people and we ascribe motives, like they just want your money, or 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 he's, you know what I mean? That that's pointless. That's immature. There's so much nuance. But if you if you want to be quoted, quote. And and when you can give attribution, give it. And um, I think that's really important. I, I think that goes towards building credibility. And and if you if you don't remember where it came from, say, you know. I heard a really good thing the other day. I don't know who said it, but I love it, and, and here it goes. And it may have been you. <laughs> you know, for, you might have one of your friends lean over and say, "It was you, stupid. You're the one who said it." You know, because the, there's so much going on in our lives today, and and so much noise um, that sometimes it's hard to to uh, to, to wheedle through. <clears throat> but to the point that that my good friend Steve is raising. If you completely lift someone's program or someone's idea, um, like my good friend Andy Fredericks, if you went out and said, you know, little drops of water was yours, 
that's wrong. That 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 that's wrong. That's stealing. Um, you know, if you take somebody's program, or, or you know, if you took Rick Lasky's pride and ownership and got up and started doing it, and and you called it Bobby Halton's pride and ownership, that's wrong. Now, if you want to do your own version of pride and ownership, God bless you. You know, uh, Bobby Halton's get up and go. You know, or, you know, or whatever. That's fine. But if you lift his stuff specifically, then you should say, hey, as our good friend Rick Lasky says, you know, wear your uniform with pride and be on time and make a difference and, and all the great things that Ricky said in Pride and Ownership. But, you know, I used to hand out my PowerPoints uh, in class, and, and I stopped doing it because so many times I heard about people just lifting them and then getting paid to deliver a program that I might have done for free for somebody. And, and that... And that and that you had spent dozens of hours on trying to uh, dial in. Right, but but I have presented programs that I've bought and parts of programs that I've borrowed from folks. Like my good friend Joe Kittner did a did a fast food PowerPoint one time. I said, "You mind if I use some of this?" He said, "Use the whole damn thing." But I always tell people in the slide set from my good friend Joe Kittner because right. he 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 made the PowerPoint. But I presented. I don't. I don't do anything more than show the slide with Joe's name on it. And, and he right. gave me that PowerPoint 10 years ago, and it's still a great PowerPoint. And, right. and you know, so there's, there's going to be, you know, if someone gives you permission, knock yourself out. But, you know, if, if you're just taking something, try to, try to give attribution where you can. Bobby, as far as the magazine and the fire engine content, the instructor wants to borrow that or use it in a program, uh, in its entirety, can they do that? And and if so, what do they have to do? What laws provide for is one time. Well, they they provide for one time use for educational purposes only. You can do that. You can take any magazine article, and 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 put it into your class, and and that's that's legal. But if you're going to get paid for it, or you're going to distribute it um, for remuneration, in other words, it's going to be part of something. Then you need to get the author's permission and the publisher's permission, and and that it, to do that you go to a website called copyright.com. So if you want to use something and you're going to get paid, go to copyright.com. It'll keep you from getting in trouble, and it's a pretty simple process. You just submit a piece of paperwork, and and most people are going to give you permission to use it. And again, as long as long as you give attribution, if you say you know it was Positive Power by Chief Brunacini, is published by Fire Engineering, and in the July 2015 edition, you're, you're going to be okay. You know, you're going to you're you're not going to get your 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 butt sued. But you know, if if you just lift you know five fire engineering magazine articles and you publish them in you know Bobby Halton's weekly magazine and you charge people money for it, you'll get sued. We got a question on Twitter. I'd like to throw out there for Bill Carey, uh, going back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, and that is should fire departments have a ride along program for instructors so the instructors are familiar with the department before they teach there? And um, I thought that was an interesting question. I'll let Aaron answer it in a second, but I do know some of the people I know that travel in town a day early and spend that day at the firehouse, you know, if they're teaching engine company operations, they go over the rig, open all the compartments, look at the hose rolls, talk to the driver engineer, talk to the firefighters so they understand how their rigs are set up so that they're not teaching something completely contrary. Uh, I think it's a great idea. How, how, how do you handle that, Aaron? Yeah, I, I do the same thing. I mean, even if when I'm teaching here at the local academy, I'll, I'll look at who's on my roster and, uh, and, and try to get it make sure I know what's going on in the in that firehouse as far as their equipment goes and things like that um, but we try to go in a day early if I'm traveling somewhere I do try to get to the firehouse the day before I'm going to do the training and we might not necessarily do a ride along but we're definitely going to be in there in their you know apparatus floor and uh, looking at the rigs getting an idea of where things are laid out how they do it you know uh, what, whatever the pertinent stuff is going to be I, I think Bill's got a great point there that uh, you do, you, you can't come in blind because you're just not prepared enough to deliver the right training, I think. But uh, 
so coming in and 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 seeing seeing what nozzles they use. Are they using smooth bores or are they using you know fog nozzles or you know do they run a Minuteman loads versus triple lays? It it all helps us. It all helps us prepare for a better uh, better presentation. So okay. yeah, I, I think it's a it's very important to do it. And and that goes back to you doing your homework, which lends credibility to the program you're going to deliver. It, it, it's definitely all interconnected all the way through the from from the time they say hey you've been assigned to teach this class at the academy or hey we're hiring your group to come in and teach us to the time where you sign their certificates it's all interconnected absolutely and, and I think all that goes right back to the topic for the day which is credibility and and if you show the interest in learning the department and how they operate and then your teaching pulls some of that information that they're familiar with and how they operate then they're gonna feel that you're a much more uh, credible instructor which benefits you personally as well yeah yeah uh oh we gotta un unmute Bobby <laughs> but uh, yeah it's uh, it, it does go back to that and, and I think it, it can be a liability issue too I mean if we're going in and we're, we're teaching things that are just not the way they do things and we're, we're basically we're setting them up for failure we're, we're creating liability so um, you know, having a pre-plan for everything we do in, in life is, is a lot easier when it comes to the fire service. We have to do that. Uh, it, it, and it does. It brings that credibility to you. It certainly does. Bobby, I think you're muted. <laughs> Uh-oh. Now he's leaving. <laughs> He'll figure it out. I don't know how that even happened. My my friend, my, our producer, who I don't see, must have muted me. <laughs> um, it's, but doesn't it depend on what you're teaching in, in a lot of instances? In other words, Aaron, you do a lot of uh, tactical task level training. Clearly, you need to know what their hose loads are, what their truck functions are, what their capabilities are, whether they've got a tillered rig or a, yes. a quint. Or, I mean, so the, that, that level of nuance... But if you're bringing in, and I'm just going to throw my good friends Ricky and, and, and uh, John under the bus, if you're bringing in Ricky and John to do five alarm leadership company, I, I don't think you need to have them come in a day early to, you know, basically a no. phone call might suffice it to say, you know, this is our rank structure or whatever, some basic right. familiarity. Uh, I, I, I think it, I, I think in uh, just my opinion, and, and, and that's all it is, it, I think it depends upon what the folks are being brought in to teach. Yeah, and uh, because you could bring in, say you're going to bring in my good friend Dave Dodson to do reading smoke. Yeah. Clearly, you don't need to bring him in the day before because your smoke is going to look pretty much like my smoke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think that's a great that's a great uh, observation. You're absolutely right, uh, and and that's true because I probably see it from a, a more jaded way because I do mostly tactical things. Uh, but a guy coming in and doing leadership and, you know, Mike Dugan doing This House Rocks with, with you know, Mike Galliano, they don't – they may come in a day early just to hang out and see what's going on in the firehouse and get a feel for it, but they don't need that to present their program because it's such a it's such a dialed-in program for all of us. Right, so, and, yeah. and, and like a guy like me, I don't do tactics. I'll do decision-making. I'll do leadership. I'll do – you know, I do a lot of uh, motivational speaking, that kind of stuff. I'll do problem solving. Uh, you know, I'll do learning from the experience of others. But I don't do, you know, stretch this way or load this. I don't do that okay. stuff because I haven't been on a fire truck in 10 years other than as an observer. You know what I mean? And a volunteer. But, but even in my volunteer department, I'm not allowed to pack up anymore. I'm not allowed to, you know, medically, I'm not allowed to do that. So even even when I go on a job with my volunteer company here, I'm just a I'm an IC. I'm I, I'm not you know I'm not a I'm not a I, I'm allowed to sit in the command unit. I'm allowed to give advice or be a safety officer. So I I don't I I by choice have said I can't do that anymore because I'm so disconnected from you know the tools equipment and the environment that you guys are functioning in. It's ten years ago, and 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 that's a lot of time. And you know what, Bobby? But that's that's a perfect example of an instructor knowing what they should and shouldn't do, and what they should be teaching or what they shouldn't. I, I I'm not sitting in that leadership role 
I haven't lit, written a bunch of leadership stuff because my leadership is from the front seat versus the big office and the big chair. So I don't feel that I would be a really practical speaker at something that Steve is much more experienced at and much better at. But we do see this all the time in the fire service where it's, you know, guys are jumping in and because they see an opening to teach where they, they got an idea that maybe they can get themselves published in this, they do it. And that kills the, it really kills the training aspect of it and the credibility right away. Well, Tony just tweeted in something here. Did you see Tony's last tweet? Uh, and I apologize. Tw Twitter's been blowing up, but I'm not paying attention because I'm old. <laughs> but Tony just said, you can interview the classroom instructor to show their capability on Skype. Yeah, I, I, I think I think there I think there's some um, I think there's some uh, guys you could do that with. It. Other, other guys you don't need to. I mean, if you're bringing in Alan Brunacini, you pretty much know what you're going to get. Yep. If you don't, you've been living under a rock. <laughs> um, you know, if you if you're going to be bringing in, uh, you, you know, uh, Steve Kerber or 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 Dan Majikowski, you know what you're going to get. I mean, right. I, I think if you don't know the guy, I think Tony's got a good point. Or gal, you know, give her a call and say, hey, you mind if we have a conversation? I'd like to see, you know, what you're going to present or what's your take on this or that, so that you know they are a good fit. So I guess the the level of because uh, there are some "Quote unquote national folks out there that if you, if you know you know what you you know Benny Rubin, Alan Brunacini, you know Anthony Castros, you know they're really big name guys and gals. Um, you, you know what you're getting. Yeah, absolutely. We're we're getting close on time. I, there's a couple things I wanted to hit on. One of them uh, to you, Bobby, is we're talking about instructors. We're talking about credibility. Um, I know that you're looking for instructors as we speak for FDIC 2016. Do you want to talk about that real quick before we I run only, out of time? I'm only looking for 300. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Um, yeah, the call for presentations is open. Uh, one of the things I'd highly recommend to anybody who's listening to this right now, and um, you don't have to be, you know, uh, Rick Lasky. You don't have to be Alan Brunacini. Um, some of the best classes are by young men and women who've got three or four or five years on the job, but they're talking about fire ground experience or something that they're very good at or, or, or some area of the country where they've been participating and, and have a great deal of knowledge in it, whether it's silo fires or tractor accidents or whether it's you know, um, being a good team player or, or uh, you know, uh, pub ed or uh, mental health issues maybe they've gone through some experience um, you know we've got a we've had marvelous instructors last year who, who spoke about autism because their children were autistic so they really knew what they were talking about they understood the topic they understood the 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 importance of it everybody's got something to share and contribute so don't discount yourself because you're not you know the the, the uh, you know the guy who's you know, flying around the country all the time. Your voice is just as important to me. And and if you want to get selected to be a presenter, one of the best ways is to contribute to Fire Rescue Magazine or Fire Engineering Magazine or or online at Firefighter Nation or or, or Fire Engineering. And and then the, the reviewers. I don't pick the classes all by myself. Um, as Steve and and Aaron can tell you, I use about 50 people that review all the presentations. Like if it's got to do with, with instruction, it goes to Steve and Aaron. And they'll get a stack of 50 or 60 proposals and they'll go through them to try to delve down uh, as to what the individual may or may not know or whether the program would resonate with the audience. And then they grade it and rate it and then they send it to me and, and, and I send it to my executive group that again delves down into it. And then we spend, we actually spend t two months doing this and then we spend an actual week, myself and my executive staff, where we go through each and every proposal individually, page by page, and the evaluations. And that's how you get selected. So <clears throat> it doesn't matter if you've never met me or you've never met Glenn Corbett or you've never met you know, uh, <clears throat> any of the other folks that, that, that are they're involved in the process. A well-written proposal, and I know it's limited characters, so it's difficult. 
a good title, and and uh, you know you're in. And one of the remember we do four hour programs and we do one hour forty five minute programs classrooms, and we really do have two hundred and eleven slots for one hour forty fives. I've got eighty slots for workshops, and if you want to teach hands on. It's very difficult, and, and, and I hate to say that because, um, and, and you can ask Aaron. Aaron submitted a few times and, and hasn't cracked the ice yet, right, Aaron? Yeah, yeah, we uh, we did hot years ago, and, and since then, uh, the ideas are wonderful, but the, the logistics and the resources really, really limit what you can, what, what and you can describe it better than I, but what fire engineering and, and Penwell can actually do. Right, and we do 21 hands-on training programs, 21, and, and we're probably going to do more this year. We're probably going to do 25, um, but I only have, can get so, my friends that lend me my equipment can only give me so many air packs. I only have so many engines. I only have so, so, enough staff, safety-wise, to, to deploy so many, you know, safety officers and medics, so I'm limited. Um, and also, if, if you're sending me a class on uh, forcible entry, it has to have something in it that's different than what Chris and my friends from Chris's group are doing now. So look at the descriptions that are already up there. Um, and I do rotate in and out different groups. My, my great friend and a, and a man who I absolutely love, Dave McGrell, taught uh, standpipe operations for many years for me. Well, we had declining interest in the class, so I furloughed it. I furloughed it for four years. Last year, it was back. Um, so, so things have a cycle. Uh, my great friend Curtis Burt, who was teaching Chief Lasky's um, Saving Your Own class, I, I furloughed that class because as I looked around the country, a lot of that's being covered in um, uh, other programs because it's been so widely accepted. Now that doesn't mean that someone couldn't come up to me and say, uh, put in a proposal and say, hey guys, uh, look, uh, Saving Our Own needs to be updated with XYZ. Steve looks at it and says, this guy's exactly right. He hands it over to uh, John O'Connell or Mike Nasta who says, hey, that's spot on. I haven't seen this before. And we bring that program back with maybe a different crew because they saw some new stuff or maybe the stress inoculation uh, stuff got included into it um, and it made it more, more resonant. Or someone has an out-of-the-box proposal um, like I saw the other day, I'm not going to say what it was because I don't want people to emulate what this person thought of, but it was a neat idea and and, and, and uh, it hasn't been accepted yet because, but I, I read it and I thought, wow, that's a neat idea. Um, so if you have a hands-on deal, it's tough ice to crack and no matter how much I love you or no matter how much everybody knows you or how great your idea is because Aaron's and Bill and, and, and the folks that work with them, or some of the, my favorite people on the whole planet, we couldn't make it happen. It was a great idea, couldn't make it happen. And, and, uh, uh, and so understand that getting rejected by FDIC didn't mean you didn't have a great idea, it just means we couldn't accommodate it. And also if your class gets rejected, it might be because although you had a great idea for a class, nobody knew who you were. You, you, knew, you never wrote about it or blogged about it or submitted anything so no one could vet whether or not you really knew what you were talking about or your bio was too sketchy like if your bio said you got hired by St. John's Fire Department spent eight months uh, then went to uh, West Eastbrook Fire Department as the chief of operations there's a gap there <laughs> that we may want to know what you were doing and if you weren't doing anything you're highly suspect so um, Credibility. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 you gotta, you gotta have some work history, uh, and it, to, depending on the topic. But if it says uh, uh, tying off equipment and and uh, um, uh, uses of ropes on the fire ground, and you're a three-year firefighter, but you write a description where you said, you know, rope has evolved, and this is what the new rope can do, and this is some of the new knots, and this is some of the new, what, and you know it. Man, oh man, you will be there. You know what I mean, and 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 yep. you can take that to the bank. So yeah, I'm looking for 300 instructors. <laughs> I'm looking for 190 hands-on training people. Um, so if you're one of those folks out there, please uh, sign up um, and and go to fdic.com. 
click on the call for presentations and submit your class, submit your idea. Um, you know, it, 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 and I'll tell you something neat. This is a true story, and I, again, I know we're going way over, and my <laughs> producer lady is probably going to kill me, but uh, ten, 10 years ago, uh, Dan Majikowski, Steve Kerber was still working at NIST, and, and Dan sent in a couple of classes, and a couple of them I picked up, a couple of them I rejected, and uh, I've rejected two of Dan's classes last year, just so you know. I've turned down. We couldn't fit them in, so don't feel bad. Dan Majikowski had two classes canceled or not, not picked up. Kerber's had... Bruno and I submitted The Fog of the Fire Ground two years in a row, and we've been rejected. <laughs> so don't feel bad. I've been rejected a lot. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, you could hold the NIST UL, the, the NIST, it was just NIST back then, in a phone booth. Dan used to get, and Steve, you can back me up on this, five, yep. seven, eight, Firefighters in the classroom. Maybe, maybe in a big, a big year he got twenty. Where is he today? Hmm. So he persevered, uh, right? Absolutely, hundreds, hundreds, thousands. Yeah. Um, yep. so, so you know, my good friend Joe Pernesti, and I'll throw Joe under the bus, who I think is one one of the the best new writers we have. A great guy, Ohio dude just this lovely human being. I, I think the world of him. He, he came to me after FDIC and he said, uh -oh. Down, Fido! Down, killer! The killer, the little one. I put the big one outside. <laughs> your, your cat has a hairball. <laughs> anyway, the uh, Joe came to me and he said, I didn't pack the room. I, I let you down. I said, no, you didn't. You had people who cared about Main Street firefighting. And I said, Joe, and I guarantee you this, next year there'll be people the room will be full, and the year after that, they'll be lining up outside the door. It just takes time. It just takes yep. time. There's yeah. there's no shortcuts. I hate I hate square rooters, and I hate people that take shortcuts. I hope that came across during our credibility talk. So if you're if you're one of those people, we're not going to use you. But if you've paid your dues, or if you're in the system and you're working the system correctly and honestly, we're all about you. Uh, thanks, Bobby, for that. And uh, I know we're in overtime. I wanted to just recap uh, a few points that I jotted down during our present our talk today, um, and those were some of the highlights. You know, when we're talking about credibility of instructors, uh, give credit, or as Bobby talked about, give attribution to those that you borrow uh, information from or quote. Make sure that you're proficient in the task or the topic that you're talking about. Um, you got to be proficient as it first before you can teach it. Uh, make sure that you learn and know your environment where you're going to teach, especially if it's a different department or a different part of the country. Know the community, the fire department. If you're teaching a tactics class, you need to know a little bit about their tactics, as we talked about. Um, be aware of the culture and the environment. Different parts of the country are very different. Um, different parts of the world are even more different, as Aaron talked about. You know, he, he read some books about some foreign countries just to make sure that heating that would be insulting to people that normally we wouldn't think is insulting and and unfortunately we still hear stories about instructors that are using slang making fun of religions and things like that and there's probably uh, in this day and age there's no place for that and it, it hurts the credibility of instructors and then finally I, I brought up you know is there a problem or an issue that they're bringing you in to solve and if they are you need to know what that is so you can properly address that uh, if you're being brought in to be an instructor especially from the outside um, you need to find out if that department is trying to fix a, a specific problem or, or they just got interested in you because they saw you at FDIC, they read your book, and they just think it's good information. Um, but those are, the, those are the hot button things that we talked about in the last hour that I wanted to recap. Uh, I know that next Wednesday there's another hump day hanging out at 1 o'clock with our good friend Bill Gustin and Mike Dugan. And uh, with that, Aaron, any final words before we wrap for this month? No, I think that uh, I think we covered a lot of stuff. Uh, this is one of those that we could do every month, probably just on the same topic, because there's so much information. But uh, I think the key is, especially for you young instructors, is surround yourself with really good people and uh, make sure that that you, you've got it figured out. You know, surround yourself with good people, listen to good people, and understand them. And when your 16-year-old comes home from school, don't walk behind the camera. <laughs> That's right. 
Say hello to the world. <laughs> but I, I appreciate it. It was another... See, that's what happens. It normally is over at 2 o'clock, so I'm safe, and he walks in at, you know, 2.05, so I'm safe. Yeah. <laughs> Overtime. Well, we got to watch the clock better. Thanks, everybody, <laughs> for watching. Aaron and I will be back talking training again next month, Wednesday, July 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, thank you, Chief Halton, for joining us once again. And uh, until then, be safe and keep on training.